welcome into the Radiopedia reading room for another week, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. It's a radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me once again, like a thromboembolic weed killer, it's my (laughs) co-host Frank Gaylor. That's an obscure one. Sounds like you're (laughs) describing my very brief foray into interventional radiology. Did you do it? (laughs) I pretended to be. When I came back from Canada after one of my fellowships, uh, where I had done diagnostic cerebral angiography, Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, eh, you know, how hard could it be? Not that hard. And I had to <laughs> locum uh, for six months at a, at a hospital here in Melbourne. And they put me on the interventional roster doing peripheral oh. angiography and all sorts of things. And I rapidly realized eh, it's not quite as easy as it looks. <laughs> and two, it's really not suited to my temperament. So, <laughs> uh, Well, it is kind of interventional, this episode. But I did give you that hint last week. I told you yeah, we were having an me. interventional radiologist on. So the topic for this week is transarterial chemoembolization, also known as TACE. Ah, uh, and as I said last week, it's a readful episode. So I was joined just a few days back by interventional radiologist Heather Moriarty to record this one. So I, I said weed killer in the intro because that's what we call chemotherapy at my hospital. Or more, spe- <laughs> more specifically, that's what we call the oncology meeting. So you'll go like, oh, I've got to go take the weed killer meeting. <laughs> and then for radiation oncology, we call that the burn. So oh, I've got to go do the burn. And then for interventional radiologists, we call them stretches. Have you got any shorthand for like different uh, craft groups in the hospital? We call ultrasound ultra pound. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it's always painful. We do that as well. We just call it the pound now. And uh, our duty registrar, who takes all the calls, they sit in the doghouse. And and the main area where we report is called the bunker because it's dark, no windows in the middle of the department. We used to have one area where you just go and all you do would be outpatient studies. So like CTs, ultrasounds, x-rays, whatever came through outpatients. We used to call that the sweatshop. It was like going into <laughs> it and then it got shortened to the sweater. So oh, I've got to go to the sweater this afternoon. <laughs> Do you reckon this is an Australian thing that we kind of come up with these little names for things? Do you reckon it happens around the world as no, well? Everywhere must, surely. But sometimes, like, because I've been, you know, taking a fair bit of long service leave recently, sometimes I come back to work and someone says something and I'm like, I don't know what you're referring to. Like, there's some <laughs> new word has evolved. And they're, or they're referring to someone, someone's got a new nickname, and you're like, who, who are we talking about here? <laughs> All right, should we play a quick game of uh, Spot the Fake? Because that's what we do with our readfuls. Yes, you usually try and catch me out. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah. Let's try. Now, look, I didn't actually have time to write one properly this week, so I kind of outsourced it a bit to a highly reliable chatbot. <laughs> <laughs> so these are physiology facts about the liver because taste oh, is primarily okay. yes. used for the liver, right, yep. uh, as we'll learn about soon. So I'll read you these three statements. Two are true. And one is fake and you need to spot the fake, Gaylord. All right, statement number one. It is commonly accepted that 50% of oxygenation to the liver is provided by the hepatic arteries and 50% via the portal vein. Hmm. Statement number two. Each day, the typical adult human, that's you, Gaylord, produces 60 to 100 mils of bile. I'm pretty sure I produce more than my average share. I know, of but bile. that's that's verbal, mate. I'm talking about the actual <laughs> bile. Uh, and statement number three: hepatocytes are responsible for the production of 80 to 90 percent of the circulating innate immunity proteins in the human body. Hmm. Which of those sounds fake to you, mate? Ugh. I really don't. I know what you've done. You've got three normal facts and then you've just changed some of the figures and <laughs> and probably by like 5%. <laughs> so innate immunity proteins. I don't even know what that means. Can I, would you want me to give you a little, yeah, give a little me an help example. on that one? I think like the compliment cascade is an example oh. of innate immunity. Okay. Well, that sounds right. I mean, the liver would produce most of those I would expect. 50% each. I reckon we produce a lot more bile than 60 to 100 mils. Gallbladders okay. are pretty sizable sometimes and they empty after each meal. And I reckon mm-hmm. a gallbladder, when it's distended, probably contains that much. So I, I reckon two is false. I'm going with 250 mils of bile a day. Okay. So you think 50% of the oxygenation to the liver comes via the portal vein? Well... You can occlude either of the two and the liver doesn't infarct, right? So there must be enough there. 
Oh, you got it right, mate. You got it right. Oh, yeah. And in fact, you said, you know, you've adjusted it by 5% or something. No, I, I adjusted by an order of magnitude. So the amount of bile you produce in a day is about 600 to 1,000 mils wow. per day. That's a lot of bile. That's a lot of bile. And that actually reminds me of CSF as well, because mm. CSF, you produce 500 mils a day. Um, That's right. a day. And then the actual volume of CSF that anyone has in their body, you know, if you're a, you know, haven't got too much atrophy in your brain, is about 150 yeah. mils. And so therefore you're replacing your total volume of CSF multiple times over each day. That's how dynamic the CSF circulation is. And that's why keeping patients lying down for four hours after a lumbar puncture with an atraumatic needle is completely unnecessary because absolutely f yep. the five mils that you've taken off are going to be produced within a few minutes. I fed you a neuroradiology topic now. That's not fair. To get, let's get back onto the liver. <laughs> so we're going to learn in this episode, actually, that over 95% of the blood supply to liver tumors is from the hepatic artery, whereas 80% of the blood supply normally to the liver parenchyma is from the portal vein. So that's why we can do these arterial embolizations and specifically target tumors. So therefore, 80% of blood supply to the liver comes from portal vein, 20% from the hepatic artery, but because of the differential amounts of oxygen in each, yep. it actually works out to about 50% of oxygen comes from the artery versus from the portal vein. So that was true. Uh, and then, yeah, the other one, the one about the innate immunity, you know, those complement, all those different proteins that the liver makes. So the liver actually is a really important immunological organ in the body, particularly from an innate immunity point of view. All right, so thank you to ChatGPT for your help with putting together <laughs> <laughs> that little segment. Uh, so let's listen into the Readful episode now. Uh, oh, before I do, though, Heather lives in Ireland, Frank, and um, <laughs> while we were recording this episode, a farmer next door, <laughs> sounds very Irish, decided to drive back and forth on his tractor. <laughs> so I have had to use a pretty strong noise filter at times on Heather's audio. And if I didn't do that, otherwise you would have heard, obviously, the tractor uh, as well as the farmer, you know, so, potato, potato, potato. I had to kind of, <laughs> I had to progressively put the noise filter up until you couldn't hear him saying that. <laughs> no, he he wasn't saying, I, I'm I'm being mean. He he was saying, to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, let's learn about trans-arterial chemoembolization with Heather Moriarty, and then Frank and I will be back for another chat in the outro. Joining me now in the reading room all the way from Cork, Ireland, it's interventional radiologist Heather Moriarty. Thanks for being here, Heather. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. I'm delighted to be able to chat with you. You're one of the few radiologists, I think, to have come to Australia to do a fellowship, successfully sit and pass our board exams, only to, for some reason, return to Ireland anyway. <laughs> I must be, yes, but I do have a lasting uh, fondness for the place. We're having some particularly lovely weather here in Cork at the moment, as I was saying to you, we're looking out at the, the beautiful bay here. But uh, in the deep midwinter, I do occasionally check the Melbourne weather app with the tiniest tinge of chagrin. <laughs> Well, this is a readful episode, Heather. So you've selected a Readypedia article for me to read out to you. And the article is TACE, which is transcatheter arterial chemoembolization. Now, other than the fact that you presumably know a lot about this topic, is there any other reason you've chosen this one? Well, it's one of the more common and realistically, it's one of the more widely available interventional oncology procedures. TACE is actually relatively low tech. So not everyone, for instance, will do IRE or radioembolization. But if you have an angio suite at your institution, you, you probably can do TACE. So it's a mm -hmm. good one for radiologists and clinicians to have like a general handle on when you might use it or broadly what the procedure entails. And I know very, very little about it. So this will be exciting. Should I start reading? Fire ahead. Transcatheter arterial chemoembolization, TACE, also known as transarterial chemoembolization, is a minimally invasive method of administering chemotherapy directly to a liver tumor via a catheter under digital subtraction angiography. The chemoembolic agent may be delivered as a mixture of lipiodal, also known as conventional TACE, or as an injection of drug-eluting beads known as DEB TACE. Sounds like a dance step. DEB TACE. Transcatheter arterial embolization, TAE, also known as bland embolization, i.e. without a chemotherapy agent added, is an alternative treatment option, and there is evidence that its efficacy is comparable to TACE. That's the intro. 
That's right. Yes. I think one of the things that trainees or certainly I found confusing when I was a trainee is the terminology because we have loads of different acronyms. As you said, TASE stands for transarterial chemoembolization. Often we just call it chemoembolization. But then you can use acronyms based on the technique of the procedure, like BTACE is where a balloon catheter is used to prevent reflux. CTACE stands for conventional TACE, which, as you mentioned, is, is when the drug is directly injected, essentially, with lipidol. And then mm-hmm. Deb TACE, that dance step, is where <laughs> uh, chemo is loaded onto the beads and then they're used as the embolic agent, trying to allow for release of the chemotherapeutic agent in a sustained manner. And then depending on what drug is used, there are a whole host of other acronyms like Deb Docs, where doxyrubicin is loaded onto beads or Debiri, uh, which is irinotecan loaded beads for metastolic colorectal cancer. So, yeah, we'd have a, a whole host of dance steps. <laughs> and then after that, then there are a number of other transarterial therapies. So like TAE is often referred to as bland embolization, where you're not using chemo, but you're using the embolization effect. And then there's radioembolization, hepatic arterial infusion, and there are, are a whole host of different indications and, and pros and cons for all of those, which is probably another day's podcast. Mm-hmm. Sounds like it. Should we get into the next little section of the article, which is titled History? And it says over 95% of the blood supply to a liver tumor is from the hepatic artery, whereas 80% of the blood supply to the normal liver parenchyma is from the portal vein. Therefore, embolization of the hepatic artery can be performed in order to induce tumor necrosis while preserving background liver function. The technique of using embolization in combination with local chemotherapy agents was developed in the early 1980s and has since evolved into what is now known as transcatheter arterial chemoembolization. TACE. See, 80s, dance moves. That's what it was. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so um, exactly, like all the procedures that I just mentioned, the vascular interventional oncology procedures, they rely on the fact that there's a dual blood supply to the liver, which is really important. So the portal vein drains the splanchnic circulation and supplies the majority of the liver parenchyma, whereas the tumours that we treat, like for instance HCC, are the ones that get their blood supply from the hepatic artery. And we all know that as diagnostic radiologists, because when we get a multiphase CT or MR, Uh, What we're looking for in HCC is that avid arterial Uh phase enhancement when the hepatic artery is filling. And then we can take advantage of that by treating through the hepatic artery and the portal venous supply to the liver parenchyma is untouched. And so does that imply that hypervascular metastases are also better treated this way or it's more effective with this treatment than non-hypervascular metastases? Exactly right. Exactly. Awesome. You see, I'm just making stuff up. (laughs) All right. The next little section is indications and we have this broken into three dot points the first one is unresectable hepatocellular carcinoma so hcc and usually barcelona clinic liver cancer stage b and that's either as palliative treatment or as a bridge to a liver transplant and it could be an adjunct to radiofrequency ablation or anti-angiogenic agents And then the second indication we have is for hepatic metastases, most commonly from colorectal carcinoma. And then the third one is for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Yes, we can treat a number of different tumor types, as you mentioned. So overall, HCC is by far the most commonly treated tumor in the liver. Uh, But we also treat a number of other lesions like cholangiocarcinoma, hepatic metastasis, And as I said, most of the evidence that we have uh, for metastatic disease is in the treatment of colorectal nets, but we are getting more and more data for other tumor types. There's good data for neuroendocrine tumors. TACE has been used to treat liver mets from other solid organ tumors like pancreatic, gastric, breast. To be honest, you name it, if a tumor has metastasized to the liver, someone has tried to embolize it. (laughs) But the data for these ones is certainly more limited. We certainly have the most data really for HCC and then colorectal and, and neuroendocrine um, and then taste fits into the algorithm like separately for each tumor or, or really each patient uh, but in general if you're kind of looking at a bigger picture mm-hmm. if a patient can have surgery then that's the gold standard and then at the other end of the spectrum if they have extensive extra hepatic metastasis well then just treating the liver isn't going to help much so mm-hmm. we use taste for the intermediate stage tumors and the goal of local regional therapies like taste can be one of three things. It's either curative intent, uh, which is often when we're using ablative techniques, 
or to try and downstage a patient to resection or prevent progress, for instance, while they're waiting surgery or transplant. And then finally, um, and the majority of taste procedures would fall in here, is where we're doing it as a palliative procedure. So not aimed for a cure, but it can still prolong a patient's life or sometimes improve their quality of life by alleviating symptoms. What kind of symptoms do you mean, like mass effect of the metastases on the liver capsule, things like that? Yes, certainly sometimes, but also neuroendocrine tumours. If they have significant uh, symptoms from neuroendocrine mets, octreotide symptoms, you can uh, treat those so you can alleviate those symptoms. And so if there are any metastases outside of the liver elsewhere, you would not perform a taste procedure or you could still potentially consider that? You can still potentially consider it if it's liver dominant disease. Mm -hmm. So again, you're looking at like a very low burden uh, of extra hepatic metastasis. So, you know, maybe a couple of portal lymph nodes or very low volume of metastasis elsewhere. But in general, the vast majority that we would treat would be localized only to the liver. Let's move on to the next section. And this is, we've done the indications. Now it's time for the contraindications. And our article divides this into two. So we've got absolute contraindications and then relative contraindications. So with the absolute ones, we have extensive tumor infiltration throughout the liver, a large burden of extrahepatic metastases, as we already said, encephalopathy indicating liver decompensation and anaphylaxis to the iodinate. Iod. <laughs> Go again. Iodinated. It's not that hard. <laughs> iodinated. Anaphylaxis to the iodinated contrast. And then the uh, relative contraindications are portal vein thrombosis, hepatic or renal failure, uncorrectable coagulopathy, and significant arteriovenous shunting of blood through the tumour. That one sounds important. How do we define that? Well, I suppose specifically to shunting of blood, some of those you will look for on the pre-procedural imaging and also the radiologists will look for it when they're doing their angios. Mm -hmm. um, and some of these, I mean, are, are kind of standard angio contraindications like contrast allergy, uncorrectable coagulopathy. And then I consider the more specific contraindications would be like liver related, so decompensated cirrhosis or impaired liver function or tumor related, so extensive extrahepatic disease, extensive bilober involvement, malignant portal vein thrombosis is at least a relative contraindications, but it's one of the reasons that you might use radioembolization instead of TACE. Um, and then there's patient related, which are kind of usually just significant comorbidities. Now we're going to take a little break from the article here, Heather. I'm going to throw a little random question at you. This is what we like to do with our podcast guests. And the question is, what is your favorite interventional procedure to perform or if easier what's your least favorite to perform oh uh, favorite procedure there are so many good ones it's like choosing your favorite child i uh, <laughs> i i have to say trauma embolizations are quite satisfying except the time of day they occur yes yes yeah midday trauma embolizations <laughs> midnight <laughs> um I uh, definitely developed a penchant for the IVC filters when I was over with you guys in Australia, probably because of the hundreds that you do with the Alfred every year. They're kind of low stress, like neat, quick procedures. But every so often you have to do an advanced retrieval just to keep you on your toes, to keep things interesting. It is quite satisfying. I remember doing quite a few IVC filters when I was in first year as a registrar, actually. I think we must have been doing a study or something at the Alfred, so I had the opportunity to do quite a bit. Back then, I mean, it was mainly the trauma patients with those high injury severity scores who, you know, at risk of PE, but you can't anticoagulate them. Is that still the main indication? And then what is the feeling about retrieving filters these days? So do we still go back and retrieve them months down the track or can they be left in for, for life? Mm, um, well, that first question is actually a little bit controversial. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do another podcast on that. Let's just say that it's not the main indication. Yep. Um, but yes, regarding removing them, I do think they should be retrieved down the line. I think the record one that I've seen is, is a retrieval after 13 years. And you'd be surprised, like sometimes the ones that have been in forever come out relatively easily. But the ones that have been in for like three months, maybe tilted and the, mm -hmm. the hook is endothelialized, they're the difficult ones. So I, I definitely do think you should have a shot at removing them if they're no longer indicated, even if it is down the track. You mentioned the angle. Is there a magic angle you're looking for? Oh, uh, no, just 
keep it straight. <laughs> um, but, it, you, you, but you, you know, sometimes you put it in and it, like lines up perfectly and you're just like about to let it go. You let it go and then it just falls over and all your good work is, is gone. But, you know, after um, after you put them in, you do CT. Sometimes the patients have had CTs, like the straight ones have fallen over and the, the tilted ones have straightened up. So there's no, um, there's no science to it. Yeah, no. All right, we better get back to talking about TACE. So the next section in the article is procedure. Chemoembolic particles are used to occlude the hepatic arterial supply to the tumour with resultant cytotoxic necrosis. This is achieved by superselective catheterization of the tumour feeding arteries using a microcatheter. There is a wide variability in the type of chemotherapy agent and embolization particles used, as well as the speed of injection. The most frequently used chemotherapy agent worldwide is doxorubicin. The chemotherapy agent is mixed with iodized oil, typically lipiodal. In conventional taste, administration of the chemotherapy agent is followed by mechanical embolization, typically with gel foam or PVA particles. In DEB taste, 100 to 300 micron drug eluting beads are used instead. Now, I can, I can see that you're itching to give further details on all of this, Heather. So maybe you could take us through taste from start to end. Uh, yes, I, I would love to. <laughs> um, so I guess to, uh, to start from the very start, we usually see the patients in clinic first. We'd review their imaging and their labs at that stage and then kind of assess them clinically, go through with them and their family what to expect, etc. Then on the day of the procedure, patients come in fasting. Uh, they usually get a bit of a cocktail pre-procedure. Most interventionalists will have their own variation on this, but um, I would like to give like an antibiotic, like Cipro. Uh, mm-hmm. Any of the fluoroquinolones have high biliary excretion, as you know very well, Andrew. Um, yeah, absolutely. Or... <laughs> All over that. <laughs> <laughs> There's good evidence for dexamethasone um, as an antiemetic, so I give that along with some okay. um and analgesia like paracetamol or oxycontin. And then the procedure itself is done under conscious sedation. The hepatic artery is cannulated. We do an angio. You're looking at the arterial supply to the tumour and also uh, you want to check the portal vein is patent. And from there, put in your microcatheter, advance it to the tumour um, nice and easily, hopefully, and treat your tumour with selective taste. It is actually important to be aware and, and not just for interventional radiologists, but also for the diagnostic radiologists who are reading the pre-procedure Im- imaging there can be supply to the liver tumor through extra hepatic vessels like an intercostal mm-hmm. or a phrenic, for instance. Um, and there, that's especially true for like large tumors or peripheral tumors or ones that have been previously embolized. Apparently, up to 25 percent of those have extra hepatic supply. So so that's an important one to look out for. Mm. And the AV shunting you assess at the time before you inject the yeah, material? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you, you can certainly see, and there's some great cases on Radiopedia actually, of the AV shunting um, where you can see quite large shunts. Mm-hmm. But the smaller ones you might be able to see at the, you're probably more likely to be able to see really at the time of your angio. So you're just looking for early venous filling. Uh, and, you know, if there's too much or taste, it's a kind of a judgment call by the interventional radiologist. For radio embolization, then we, again, that's another day's podcast, but because we do two <laughs> different um, angio procedures, then one where we inject MAA um, just to check the area of the tumor, uh, we get a Brenstra lung scan there and you check that there's not too much lung shunting. So uh-huh. it's uh, it's more of a factor, I suppose, in radio embolization, but it's certainly something you have to look out for, for taste. And it mentioned here the speed of injection. Is there anything specific to that? That's probably relating to reflux. If you're doing a selective taste, you want to treat the area that you're planning to treat. And if you inject too hard, it will all just reflux out. It's like, you know, if you pour too much water down the drain, it all splashes back out again. Once you're in a good position and you've got your chemo injected, you want to, it's obviously just localized to that area. So, and that's how taste works, you know, um, both conventional and deb taste have one an embolization effect so because the artery is blocked the blood doesn't mm-hmm. wash away the chemo and the drugs stay in the tumor for much longer so there's that second effect is the chemo and the first effect is the embolization and then you reduce the systemic side effects because the drug is much more concentrated to the area of the tumor and the use of the lipiodal is that mainly just so you can see that the the blood flow has slowed down or is there another reason for specifically using that 
No, it's actually it actually is an embolic in itself, the lapidol, and that's for conventional taste. So that's uh, when you just directly inject the drug with lapidol. So it will actually have a, an embolic effect itself. We tend to do a little bit more deb taste more in Europe and the US, but uh, there's definitely a role for both. Should we move on to the complications? Let's go for it. All right. So complications, and we have six dot points listed here. So first one is vascular injuries. It says vasospasm, dissection, pseudoaneurysm, thrombosis. Then it says non-targeted embolization, so particularly in the setting of anatomical variants of the hepatic artery or arteriovenous shunting. Post-embolization syndrome is the third one, and that occurs in 90% of patients, so the vast majority. The fifth one is fourth one. The fourth one is myelosuppression. The next one is infection, including sepsis and hepatic abscess. And then the final one is pyeloma. And then it goes on to say that major complications are uncommon, only occurring in 5% of patients. And patients are usually discharged within one to two days. Yeah. So again, there are your commoner garden angio complications and then specific um, to the procedure like liver toxicity post-embolization syndrome is really common. It's usually self-limiting, but it can be severe enough, like patients get nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and fever. And so it's definitely important to warn your patients about it. And if there's any Mm -hmm. other teams involved in the admission, they're always worried that they're septic because they can get a leukocytosis, raised inflammatory markers, and and they feel miserable. So um, it is important to to know about it and make sure they're charted for analgesia and antiemetics after the procedure. Regarding the most serious complications, there was a recent enough series from Germany which had almost 50,000 patients and the in-hospital mortality is about 1%. So it's not insignificant. That was related to liver uh, or renal failure or sepsis in the majority of those patients. So each of those are uncommon, but they can occur. And again, it's just important to be aware of them, uh, look out for them and, and discuss it with your patients too. We know more more and more all the time, you know, we can preempt complications better all the time. For instance, if they've had previous biliary interventions, there's a higher risk of abscess. And in these cases, maybe you'd use CERT as a, a better alternative. And with regards to, yeah, sepsis and abscess, how long after the procedure would you expect that to develop as opposed to the fever from the post-embolization syndrome? I mean, obviously, that's the difficult thing to differentiate, but um, usually the post-embolization syndrome would have resolved after a couple of days, like two or three days uh, maximum. Yeah. And then um, abscess or um, bilomas, they tend to develop. So you wouldn't really, you don't tend to see those or certainly I haven't seen them within the first, you know, five days. It's more after a week or two weeks. Now, before we move on to the next section of the article, which is outcomes, uh, it's time for another random question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This one is how would your parents describe what you do, Heather? Uh, stents and shunts. That's what my mum my mum says, I think. <laughs> that's what you do. Uh, <laughs> that's what I do. I've I've not found a very good like punchy description of IR. Uh, my uh, my three now four year old actually nephew has some good monikers for other doctors in the family. You know, if you ask him what his mom or his dad does or his uncle, he's like skin doctor for the dermatologist, yeah. bone doctor for the orthopedic surgeon, bum doctor for the colorectal <laughs> surgeon. <laughs> but but for me, he's like, yeah, she's an interventional radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is there is a very simplified one my, my kids just call me a fake doctor compared to my my wife who's a gp so she's <laughs> a real doctor, doctor. Yeah. the way i see interventional radiologists i just see them as being you know misguided radiologists really because who wants to get up in the middle of the night <laughs> coming on weekends it's craziness heather yes yeah ir is the best and the worst mostly the best but i think i do find it funny sometimes people call you in the middle of the night and they're like oh i'm sorry are you asleep? <laughs> like, no, skydiving. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, IRs perform a bit of magic, don't they? You could be a magic doctor. That doesn't sound quite right. Oh, does that it? sounds great, Dixon. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we better get back to the taste article. All right, so the next section is outcomes. Taste has been shown to have a significant survival benefit over best supportive care, as well as reducing patient symptoms and preventing tumor growth. One key advantage is that the chemotherapy agent is targeted locally, reducing the systemic side effects of intravenous chemotherapy. 
That's right. Um, so we have long term data for a number of different tumor types. Uh, and I could actually talk about the outcome data alone for an hour because there are so many trials published in this area. And... You need your own podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, specific to, to liver. But uh, I think the bottom line for TACE is that like for HCC, which is the most common, the objective response rates have been shown to be like over 50%, sometimes up to 65% for HCC. And there's also survival benefit for patients with metastatic colorectal cholangio and neuroendocrine liver mets and like i said earlier we're getting more and more evidence every week for our local regional treatment options like we're looking forward to some data from the circe debiri registry coming soon we have some excellent data for radioembolization uh, in that space too awesome all right so the next section is response to treatment Imaging is generally advised after three to four weeks, either a triple phase CT, dynamic MRI, or contrast-enhanced ultrasound. CT remains the imaging standard for evaluating treatment response. The accumulation pattern of the iodized oil, which has a distinct high attenuation appearance, and the enhancement pattern of the mass are both observed to evaluate treatment response. The greater the accumulation of iodized oil, the greater the necrosis of the tumor, and thus the greater the survival benefit. Conversely, enhancing areas within the tumour are considered to represent residual viable tumour. And so there are four types of CT imaging patterns that have been described. So type 1 is broken down into 1A and 1B. So 1A is homogeneous accumulation of iodized oil within the entire tumour and in the surrounding area. This type of accumulation indicates a good response to treatment. And 1B, homogeneous accumulation of of iodized oil within the entire tumor without accumulation in the surrounding area. And then type two is irregular accumulation of filling defects. This pattern represents suboptimal response. Type three is faint accumulation. And then type four is no accumulation. So I guess this is all talking about the conventional taste. Is that right, Heather? Exactly right. Yeah, this is for lipiodal based conventional taste. I don't, to be honest, personally use this grading system. Um, I mm -hmm. think it was developed as a tool where you can kind of immediately estimate the outcome or recurrence rate after you've done a taste. And a lot of people would do a, a cone beam CT on the table interprocedurally now to make sure that you've covered all the yeah, areas nice. of the tumor. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. It does work nicely to show you that you've taken off the vessels that you need to or covered the area well. Or, or that there's more to do, as the case may be. And we do use beads a little bit more often. So the assessment after beads is generally based on the components of the tumour, which are arterially enhancing. So modified resist is the grading system that I would tend to use. Well, that's the next part of the article. So while there is currently no standardised method of assessing treatment response, the modified resist criteria and the European Association for the Study of the Liver, EASL, criteria are typically used. Treatment response is classified as either complete response, partial response, stable disease, or progressive disease. In the setting of partial response, TACE may be repeated multiple times, but should ultimately be ceased if there is untreatable progression, which is defined by significant tumor progression, e.g. massive liver involvement, extrahepatic spread, or vascular invasion, or clinical or functional deterioration, or development of a contraindication. Yeah, so when to retreat is important. Um, usually if the liver function is okay, taste can be repeated a number of times. And often it does need to be repeated a number of times to get a complete or at least a better partial response. And that's mm -hmm. if the patient has tolerated the procedure well, there's no liver function decline or significant toxicity. And then if the lesion you're treating is refractory, um, so there's been no change to the lesion, uh, you can try a second treatment. Uh, rarely you can try a third treatment, but definitely no more than that. Like if there's no response, then maybe try something else because the toxicity is going to outweigh the benefits at that stage. You can also treat if there's no untasteable progression, we call it. So that's like progression in that there is a new lesion in a different part of the liver to where uh -huh. you treat it, then that, that's yeah. okay. You can consider that like a separate lesion but if there's new portal vein invasion or new extrahepatic disease then taste might not be the best option really that actually brings us to the end of the article but is there anything else that you wanted to mention things that weren't covered or points that you wanted to emphasize in particular yeah i think we've um, covered quite a bit there actually uh, i suppose to summarize taste is a really good local regional treatment and it's as i said fairly readily available mm -hmm. and comparatively straightforward you know compared to radioembolization or hai which we do at our institution 
and we're using it for new indications all the time, like patients with tumors that are on the larger side for ablation, the kind of three to five centimeters, we can taste and ablate those to improve our outcomes. And we're using taste for different uh, tumor types. There's some evidence that renal tumors do well with taste as well now, as well as ablation. So yeah, we're not getting um, quieter in, in angio, that's for sure. <laughs> but it's great to have um, it's great to have these options for patients with cancers, you know, to be able to offer them treatment. This area of kind of interventional oncology seems to be ever expanding, doesn't it? I think yes. the session that you're chairing at the Radio Pedia 2023 conference this year is really focused all on interventional oncology, talking about the vascular interventions like taste and cert, but also ablation techniques. So people should register. It's shaping up to be a great session. There are some other uh, great speakers as well, Roberto Casato and Stephen Power. So we'll be talking through plenty of IO from the basics to some like really amazing, unique cases. So. Yeah, I've had a sneak peek at both those lectures and there are especially some of Roberto's cases. There's some, some amazing, amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. tricky, tricky looking ones, but he makes it sound easy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no stress. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, before we finish, one, how about one more random question? Yeah, hit me. <laughs> I'll find a trickier one for you here. Let me see what I've got. Um, oh, how about this one? If you had to write a movie script tomorrow, what genre would you choose? Oh, that's a good question. Definitely not horror, like no zombies. Um, no. I like my entertainment. <laughs> I like my entertainment to be feel good. Okay, so I think life okay. has its own trials and tribulations, and if I'm watching something, I just want to be happy. So a romantic comedy. <laughs> maybe not a rom-com I'd probably write a sports related movie like maybe sailing or mountain climbing I really enjoyed the um the America's Cup documentary on Netflix did you see that one it was uh it was ah. um when Australia defeated America yes, in yes. 1983 I have seen I've seen the trailer it looks good I remember the um the quote from the Prime Minister Bob Hawke back at that time when we won it Obviously, people had to stay up quite late to watch it. And then he said, you know, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up to work today is a bum. <laughs> yeah, I know. What a legend. Classic. <laughs> and everyone's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's great. It's great. Australia are really like the underdog team the whole way through. So you're rooting for them the whole way. And then it's definitely one where I was like punching the air at the end. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Documentary is an interesting choice, actually. I mean, that's not a question I've thought about before. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Cheer, the one about cheerleading? I have not seen it. Yeah, that's good. Mm. I'm always looking for good recommendations. Yeah. It's not so much about sport, but it's very interesting, the culture okay. around cheerleading. And I think it says a lot about America and how, you know, one way of getting an education there is through sport. Yes, Okay interesting uh, life challenges yeah, yeah, going yeah. on in that one yeah there's quite a good few um good ones about mountain mountain climbing as well there's um touching the void is, is another one that i quite liked it's an oldie but a goodie it's really yeah well okay. worth watch we've yeah. turned into a uh, documentary recommendation podcast <laughs> yes. i'm sure a lad will probably have some recommendations in the outro to this episode <laughs> He'll, he'll, he'll listen to this whole episode and all he'll talk about will be documentaries, I'm sure. He'll have nothing to say about taste. Keep <laughs> to the interesting stuff. Yeah, he'll be like, I like to sleep at night time and I like to watch <laughs> <Yeah>. documentaries. <laughs> uh, well, that's it, Heather. I think we're done here. Is there anything else you want to say to finish off? Uh, no, just thanks very much for having me on. Thank you very, very much for, for making the time. And if there are any other IR topics that you think would be great to discuss on the podcast, pick an article from Radiopedia, let me know, and I'll have you back on. Sounds good. I think we've touched on a few of them, maybe IVC filters or or, or something mm. other people might also be interested in. So, uh, yeah, we could do uterine artery embolization or something like that. That, that would be, be a good, good one, one, actually, I think. it's It relates to other specialties as well, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a good one. Let's find a time. So how about how about my people? i.e. me, talk to your people, i.e. you, and we'll find a time for it and we'll make it happen. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, it's, it's night time for me here in Australia, Heather. I'm sure it's morning for you. You've got a big day ahead, so I better let you go and then I'll go to bed. All right. Enjoy your sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I hope nobody calls you. <laughs> I know for sure I won't be getting up. <laughs> there'll, be no, there'll be no waking up of me. All right. Pleasure to speak to you, Heather. Cheers, Andrew. Take care. Catch you again soon. Bye. Bye. Now, was I right, Gaylan? You don't actually have much at all to say about taste, do you? But you've got plenty to say about <laughs> documentaries and, and your need for a good night's sleep. Is that right? I would love a good night's sleep. Oh, my God. Uh, what I wouldn't do to be able to sleep properly. I'm actually, I'm a terrible sleeper because I dream 
a ridiculous amount and often wake up quite rattled by feeling as if I've had a couple of weeks of mm. just insanity. You know that scene at the start of Inception where the... Uh, or was it at the end or was it in the middle? Or, no, no, <laughs> at the start, the Chinese actor who's hired them to do the Inception is an old man and he's sort of demented and then he wakes up and he's been in the dream for what to him has felt like a lifetime. That sense of... Uh, disconnection or discombobulation is quite common and I often wake up feeling more tired than I went to sleep at least for the first while so yes I would love a bit more sleep but no I thought that was a really interesting talk I don't know much about taste but the thing that I thought was really interesting goes back to that uh, blood supply issue which is how elegant it is that based on an understanding of the physiology of the liver and liver metastases that then someone else thought up how you could exploit that for treatment. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of a, a journal article that's just been published in New England Journal Neuro, uh, but that's a really important one. <laughs> I need some because... kind of siren that goes off that alerts people. You're about to talk about neuroradiology, some kind of arachnoid membrane warning. I can just <laughs> sit in the corner quietly otherwise. But, you know, in 2008 or something, IDH was noticed in mm -hmm. glioblastomas as this, oh, it's a, a mutation. And then it was then noticed that it was really prevalent in what at the time was called secondary glioblastomas, meaning glioblastomas that arose out of lower grade tumors, which we would now call grade four astrocytomas. And then it became sort of the foundation of our current classification of gliomas. But because low grade gliomas express uh, mutant IDH, there's a number of drugs that have been developed to target IDH mutations. Mm -hmm. And in the New England Journal, June 4th, the first positive report, an indigo trial, which is a phase three trial, showed that voracidinib, which is an IDH1 and 2 enzyme inhibitor administered orally and that can get into the blood brain barrier, significantly prolonged progression free survival. And by significantly, it's not like, you know, a few months, it's 27.7 months on the drug versus 11.1 mm. months off the drug. So more yeah, than twice, yeah. which is, is massive. And it's the first significant breakthrough in, in low grade glioma treatment in, in oh. a long, long time. But the thing that I find interesting there is that this is the culmination of small steps that you go back, you know, mm -hmm. a, an understanding of basic science an observation leads to an understanding that then leads to a therapeutic intervention. And so when you hear of, countries or politicians pulling funding from basic research. Yeah. That's where the harm comes in. It's not that it's not immediately translatable, is that if you don't take those first steps, you don't end up with these treatments. So what you're saying is that taste reminded you of science. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. scientific method. Well and the thing was it was at the start of the readful. And so then I started just drifting off and wondering. <laughs> and so yeah, that's where I went. And it was not until we got to the point where we started talking about documentaries that you that you woke up again. That's have you got right. any? Have you got any documentary recommendations? Yeah, I mean, I don't watch documentaries on TV much. I tend to use YouTube for most of my non-fiction sort of stuff. Mate, I remember the other year you went to the Formula One Grand Prix entirely because you watched a documentary about it. Yeah, you? that's right. So I did watch that. But um, there's a couple that are good. So the climbing ones. If you're talking about climbing, you can't go past free solo. So free solo climbing is where you climb on your own without any ropes. Okay. If you fall, you die. And it's this bizarre guy who he didn't just climb things without any ropes. He climbed this climb that few climbers can climb with ropes and he did it without ropes. And he spent three years practicing and it's fascinating, not so much from the climbing point of view, but from how you empathize with risk differently mm. for him he must have felt quite safe but it's it's really it is very interesting see i wouldn't be allowed to watch that documentary because the wife of the podcast is very vehement that mountaineering and those kind of things she really does not like that whole thing because they always get into trouble and then there's these expensive rescue efforts that take yeah, place it, just because this person was doing something that was risky and even if you die, right, they often spend a lot of money just to recover your body. So she really is very passionate that, like, why do we do these things? Why can't well, we just do harmless things? Yeah. 
I mean, in the defense of free solo, if he fell, you you just need a um, I don't know a mop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll point that out to her. See what she thinks. <laughs> no, but the other documentary. I'm not sure if it counts really as a documentary. Is the Exit Through the Gift Shop, the Banksy one. Mm. And that's great because it's really unclear if it's a documentary or if it's made up and how much is real and how much is made up. And it's still no one knows. But it's this guy that starts following Banksy, the street artist, around and taking photos of him yeah, and then becomes an artist in his own right. But how much of this is real is not just during the documentary, but even if you try and Google it later and you read the Wikipedia page, it's still unclear how much is real and how much mm. is Banksy having you on. It's so great, though, the whole Banksy thing, I reckon. Like when the artwork got shredded after it yeah, sold that was at great. auction. I mean, just <laughs> so good. Uh, all right, we probably should wrap this episode up, Gayla, unless you've got something to say about actual taste. No. No, Sorry. okay. Other than <laughs> this is what you do every time we have like an interventional radiology topic, you're like, I'm just glad we have people like Heather who do these proceedings. I very much do. <laughs> and get up in the middle of the night while I'm having my crazy dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Getting up in the middle of the night is terrible. No one should do it, but someone has to, and I'm glad it's Heather. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now how can people get in contact with us, Frank? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and at Dr. Andrew Drickson. And you can, of course, email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and or feedback. Mm -hmm. including, I guess, documentary recommendations. Yeah, documentary recommendations, you know, which kind of accent should I do next, those kind of things. <laughs> what other group should you insult by doing <laughs> stereotypes? <laughs> uh, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? And don't forget that if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all-access pass to our online courses and conference Conference is not far away. I think we spoke about it in this episode that there's a nice interventional radiology session, which we haven't had at the conference before, and it's all featuring interventional oncology with Heather. So that's just one of the sessions we have, I think like 30 sessions going on over the five days, as well as workshops and poster sessions. So lots and lots of stuff. So please go and check it out and get registered if you haven't registered already. And by doing so, you allow us to... Give it away for free to everyone in low and middle income regions, 125 countries as it stands. Yeah, it's really, really important. And we have tiered pricing for everybody else as well based on your country and whether you are a concession status or you're a non-doctor or a trainee doctor. So we do as much as we can to make the conference as affordable um, for everyone around the world. And it's something that a lot of conferences don't do, or pretty much none do, because it's actually really difficult to administer these things. And it's actually, it doesn't make a lot of financial sense as well. Um, no, it makes no financial sense. <laughs> well, if you think about it, like if you're in a tier one country and you're a consultant radiologist and you have to pay a certain amount and then you go, oh, why are these other people getting it for free? Or why does this person get it for, you know, a quarter of the price that I have to pay. And and it makes people kind of think, oh, no, I'm not going to register for that. So we really need people, you know, if you believe in what we're doing and trying to make, you know, this globally accessible virtual conference for everyone, then please do support us and pay whatever tier level you are and come and join us in July. Uh, and what else can people do to help us out, Frank? You can help us out by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing, preferably with a catchy review yeah. associated with it as well we do need catchy catchy reviews i'll read it the little sign off here gaylard and then you can go and have a nap and have some nightmares or whatever you have nice. we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room stay rad everyone stay rad sleep tight sleep don't tight. get woken up unless you're an ir <laughs> <laughs> see you later mate bye-bye